Hello, and thanks for joining us today for this talk from Westminster Business School here at the University of Westminster. Uh, Westminster Business School, we're located here in Marylebone in the heart of central London. Uh, we've been teaching here in London for over 180 years now. Um, we're very happy to have a really diverse cohort of over 20,000 students from all around the world. Uh, the business school itself, we're home to around 350 staff and 6,000 students. Uh, about one third of those students are from overseas. So really diverse cohort, students from all around the world here in London. Today, we're really happy to present the first of our series of debates from our academic team. Uh, the topic today is digitalization and disruptive technologies. Uh, today is going to be a really interactive session. So please do use the question and answer function on Zoom here to ask any questions you might have. We'll then pose your uh, questions to our panel after the talks. You can ask questions about any of the topics on the talks or more broadly about studying at the University of Westminster. So please don't feel shy and do ask any questions you might have. Before we start the main session, I'd just like to very briefly give a, an indication of how you could join us at Westminster to study with us if you would like to make an application. We have full details of all of our programmes on our website. That's www.westminster.ac.uk. That website really is the best place to find out all the information about all of our programmes. On there, you'll find not only the different courses we offer, but really detailed information about the kind of modules you could study, uh, the kind of careers you can go into after your studies, and even kind of real, real information about how you'll be taught and the type of kind of teaching you'll have here at Westminster. All of the master's degrees are one year in length. Now, all master's degrees at Westminster will start in September, but we do have some great opportunities to begin your studies in January as well. So for our any students who are looking to start as soon as possible and start a master's course in January, there are some opportunities still to apply. I do need to point out that to make an application to start with us in January, you do need to submit that application before the 26th of November. So that's the deadline to make an application to join us in January. It's free to make an application, so we don't charge an application fee, and we try to make it as easy as possible to make an application to join us here at Westminster. On every course page on our website, you'll see a small red apply now button, and you can just press on that and it'll take you through to an online application form where you can set up a profile and begin your application. The great thing about the application process is that you don't need to complete the full application in one go, you can start the application and then come back to it and add to it as you go along before submitting the application. On the application, you'll just need to provide your personal details and give us an indication of your educational history. So that's transcripts and certificates you can upload from your bachelor's degree or from your school. You can upload your references onto the application. You can upload your proof of English. So that's either an IELTS exam or if you haven't had the opportunity to take an IELTS exam, we do have some opportunities to take online English exams as well. And you'll also have the opportunity to write a personal statement, which is your opportunity to tell us why you think this is the right course for you uh, and why you'd be an asset to us here at Westminster to study with us. And finally, you can also add your CV. So for those of you who maybe are coming to master's degree study after a period of work, so you've graduated from your bachelor's a little while ago, then your CV is a great way of showing us that you've got the skills you need to study at master's degree level. Because sometimes perhaps you might have a bachelor's degree in a slightly different subject, but you've got some fantastic professional experience, which we will take into account when we look at your application to join us here at Westminster. Normally, once you've submitted your, your application, our admissions team will get back to you. And hopefully if you meet the minimum requirements, they'll make you an offer of a place. Sometimes there's an unconditional offer, which means, yes, you've definitely got a place. Occasionally, it'll be a conditional offer. So it'll be an offer saying, yes, you have a place on the condition that you achieve something before you start your studies. Usually, this will be that you have a conditional place saying you've got a place on the condition that you complete your bachelor's degree to a certain level, and also that you get your proof of English language. So you get your IELTS exam with a certain level of English you need to study with us here at Westminster. The fees for our postgraduate programmes, our master's degrees, they range. So each course has got a slightly different fee. They start from £13,000 and go up to £19,000. But we've got full details of all of the fees for all of our programmes on our website. So each course page gives kind of the, the concise fees for that programme. 
Okay, so now that's out of the way, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Karen Jackson, who is going to lead the main, the main talk for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. That's great. Um, so on to the main substance of today. Uh, for our first debate, um, we have selected a topic which is um, overarching over a number of different courses that we teach and a number of different areas that we research within uh, Westminster Business School. So we're going to talk about digitalization. We have invited speakers from across uh, our college, our uh, business school. And uh, we're going to start with a view uh, from Sergio, who um, is going to talk to us about the idea of how digitalization has brought around changes in how we manage data and how that can be used through um, examples such as digital twins. So Sergio joins us as a professor in digital business. He also heads up Center for Digital Business Research at the university. So we will start with this view and then we will move on to having a look at how finance uh, views the, uh, the concept of digitalization. So just a final reminder before we start, that it's really nice to see so many people introducing themselves on the chat. Um, please do keep telling us where you're joining um, us from today. That's great. And um, as was mentioned by Richard, we are looking forward to you shaping the debate in the second part of today by posting your questions um, on the chat or the Q&A function. So over to you, Sergio. Hello, everyone. So as Karen said, my name is Sergio de Cesare. I'm a professor of digital business here at Westminster uh, Business School, and I'm also lead the uh, Center for Digital Business Research. And today I have the pleasure of um, uh, presenting uh, a topic which is very close to our research center because we do carry out research on this, and it is related to digital twins in the built environment. So uh, before looking at digital twins specifically, I'd like to say a few words about the, the built environment. Next slide, please. Uh, the built environment refers to the human-made environment. So you're very familiar with it. It's the homes we live in. It's the buildings we work in. It's things like hospitals, infrastructure, like railway uh, lines, and so on. So it's all those built assets uh, that exist around us. Now, there are two things that I'd like to say specifically about the built environment, which is uh, very much related to uh, the topic of today, which is digital uh, twins. And the first one is that the uh, a built asset um, in its lifetime um, is first constructed and then maintained. So we can identify specifically two major phases. One is that of design and construction. And the other one is about managing the asset. And this management of the asset can last decades, if not even centuries, because we do have some built assets that still exist today from centuries ago. And uh, the important point here to make is that nowadays, thanks to the presence of digital technology in fields like construction and architecture, information and specifically data that underpin information play a key role. And this is one opportunity where digital twins as a dis disruptive technology can play a significant role. Uh, you may be wondering, what does disruptive technology mean? Uh, disruptive technology is an innovation which can significantly alter the way in which uh, consumers, so people and businesses operate in a specific market or in an entire industry, such as in the case of construction, architecture, and civil engineering. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, before defining digital twins and looking at them more specifically, uh, I'd like to say that digital twins are possible thanks to the combination of other disruptive technologies. And I won't go into these in any detail because I think you may be familiar with the terms at the very least. And you must have heard of artificial intelligence systems. Uh, a lot is being said in the media nowadays, augmented reality. You may have used, for example, a headset at home uh, while playing virtual reality games. The Internet of Things uh, represents uh, the next evolution of the internet where we don't just have 
interconnected computers, but even interconnected devices like your phone or even wearable technology. So clothing uh, that has sensors on it that is actually connected to the internet. And as a, a basic infrastructure for digital twins, we need cloud computing and also data and information. So you may have heard the term big data and um, information modeling is significant. And our research at the Center for Digital Business Research, research focuses on making information modeling more effective um, towards digital twins. And moving on to the next slide. So this is what a digital twin actually uh, represents. So digital twin is a realistic digital representation of a physical twin. So if we take a physical twin like a building or a bridge or even something that's manufactured like a car, it would have a digital model of the building, for example. Now, the way this works is, there, is that there is a twinning process. So you have the physical twin on the one hand and the digital, digital twin on the other hand. Thanks to technology like the Internet of Things, we can have sensors all over the building, but not just in the building itself, but even in devices that are part of the building, such as uh, air conditioning units. We may be able to sense things like the temperature of a room, the, of, sorry, of a room, uh, the humidity, we can even sense the occupancy levels of, of a room. So by occupancy level, I mean the number or estimated number of people in the room, which is quite important nowadays uh, with the pandemic, as you may um, uh, understand. So all these sensors produce data. The data flows toward the digital twin. And here we have a process where data analytics uh, are used, and therefore the data is analyzed. So the digital twin is constantly monitoring the physical twin in order to understand if there is any intervention, any action to make on uh, the physical twin. So for example, if we're measuring the amount of pollutants in the air, whether it's inside the building or outside the building, uh, the digital twin may determine that the level of pollution is above a certain level and therefore could or may automatically uh, open or close the windows. So that's just a simple example of what a digital twin can do. And as a consequence, the digital twin can then uh, have data flow towards the physical twin in terms of an intervention, as I explained, and then the cycle continues. So it's a continuous cycle, and there's this complete integration between the physical twin and the digital twin. And as you can see, uh, some of the uh, insights that come out of the digital twin uh, may lead to decisions or help decision makers take effective decisions in relation to um, the physical twin. And one thing that we, we that I, I need to mention here is that fields like construction and architecture, while originally we're more concerned about uh, the geometric representation of, for example, a building, now these disciplines are mainly concerned about the needs of people who occupy and use these buildings. And therefore we can talk about the, the, the socioeconomic needs of users of built assets. So in a nutshell, uh, the digital twin is a representation of the physical twin and it is used to monitor the physical twin and eventually change the behavior in order to meet the needs of the people who uh, live in these buildings, work in these buildings and so on. The next slide, please. And uh, with most terms in, in, in our fields, um, digital twins has several interpretations. So what I gave you is a general definition, but out there, uh, people may use the term in different ways. So one way in which the term may be used is as a simple 3D model. So you see this on the left-hand side where you have a 3D model of a built asset, it looks, like uh, very similar to a portion of an airport, for example. And um, these 3D representations are actually quite important, not only in the construction phase, but also in the, that phase that comes after construction, which is about the management of the asset and facilities uh, management. So if there is a problem and the digital twin picks up, realizes that there is an intervention to make, a visual model like this one 
can actually show decision makers where the inter intervention needs to be made. A different interpretation or another interpretation of dig digital twins is digital twin as a real-time augmented reality model. And this picture is taken from um, a company called Build Dots, which applies artificial intelligence to allow construction workers to actually see uh, during the construction of a built asset, uh, where, for example, uh, certain uh, wiring will be, cabling, uh, future windows, future door frames, and so on. This information is quite important because when uh, constructing a, a building, for example, um, building workers sometimes need to guess where these uh, facilities uh, will be and where they're positioned. In this case, with an augmented reality model, uh, which can be seen either via a tablet or a headset, the, the builders, the workers on the construction site have an exact picture of what the building will look like um, in the future. And then on the right hand side, we have a digital twin as a data representation. And this is to emphasize the fact that data are quite important for digital twins. Data underpin digital twins and allow them to do all the things that I've mentioned earlier. And in the picture below on the bottom, in the bottom part of the slide, uh, there is a, a vision, uh, which is a national digital twin uh, program, which is about having an ecosystem of digital twins. So, all built assets would have in the future their own digital twin, and these digital twins would be interconnected with one another. Next slide, please. And uh, to conclude, just some benefits of digital twins. So first of all, increased sustainability. So digital twins can help us via, for example, simulations to identify the correct or um, uh, better materials to use in order, for example, to reduce the energy consumption and emissions of the built asset in the future. Uh, predicted maintenance, uh, for example, uh, if we have a lift in, in a building, we may be able to, by using artificial intelligence, predict when the lift uh, needs to be maintained before it actually fails. For example, by listening to the noises that it makes and predicting uh, possible failures based on that. And I mentioned earlier uh, different uh, simulations that we can carry out. Uh, and these are related to the so-called what if scenarios. And then there is uh, an important aspect to all this, which is the golden thread of information. So I'm stressing here the, the fact that uh, data are quite important to digital twins. Information derives from data and providing, giving meaning to data. And if we have, uh, we realize a vision like the National Digital Twin, where many digital twins need to integrate with one another, that is, it is important to have a common foundation to the information that's being integrated. And finally, uh, sorry about that. And finally, uh, the dig digital twins uh, can also act as a means for more effective urban planning and smart city management. And in the final slide that I have here, just a few references uh, that may be of interest to you. One is the Gemini Principles, which is about the um, uh, National Digital Twin. And we also have a video here that, which um, explains our research project on digital twins, the, the last bullet point there. So thank you very much for listening. And I hand it over to Karen. Thank you so much, Sergio. So Sergio will be joining us for um, the discussion and the Q&A later on. So please, if you would like to follow up with anything on what he's mentioned here, um, please do put your questions into the Q&A box and we'll pick up the questions later on. Thank you so much for everybody who's introduced themselves on the chat. That's really great. I can see like we've got um, a lot of people from various uh, areas of the world. And now we're going to go on to our second speaker for today, um, who changes focus onto finance. And Hafid is going to particularly focus on fintech, what we mean by that, and how that plays a role in financial inclusion. Um, so Hafid is a principal lecturer and has been a course leader for a variety of courses over the years, including the BSc Finance Programme. So over to you, Hafid. Uh, thank you so much, Karan, for the introduction. 
So today I'm talking about the impact of fintech on financial inclusion. As you know, that technology has reshaped, I mean, all the aspects of our life. And one of the areas being reshaped is finance. So we look how uh, financial technologies actually are enhancing financial inclusion. Next slide, please. So what is uh, FinTech? Uh, FinTech refers to new technologies and innovations uh, used to offer non-traditional and disruptive forms of financial services, uh, such as uh, uh, blockchain, uh, such as crowdfunding and electronic wallets. It also explores recent developments in electronic communication and data management uh, systems. So if you look to the graph to the right hand side of the presentation, you can see a substantial increase in investments in fintech worldwide. So for 1.5 in 2011, it has reached 74 billion in 2018. And you can see that it's growing very fastly. Uh, I mean, to, uh, the, these technologies actually making finance uh, more interesting, is making uh, uh, finance uh, more efficient, and it's also increased the speed of the way we conduct uh, finance. So, uh, uh, Professor Sergio just before referred to technologies. So, the same technologies also are uh, affecting finance, including artificial intelligence, for example, Internet of Things. Uh, uh, virtual uh, reality, uh, cloud data, and also blockchain. So uh, what happens in the uh, uh, architecture is also the same phenomenon happening in finance. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for the FinTech uh, models, uh, there are four main models of FinTech uh, depending on the provider of the financial technology. Uh, the first model is uh, by the new entrants when we have a startup or when we have a new player entering financial services for the first time using new technologies or using uh, new models. Uh, examples of this include, for example, Revolut. We have what we call N26. And also uh, there is another provider called TransferWise. So these new players actually, they have not been involved in finance before and they are experiencing this field for the first time. And they rely on technology to offer these kind of products. The second model is the FinTech, which is uh, uh, offered by existing financial institutions, such as Citibank, such as Barclays, such as HSBC, and other financial institutions. And the reason that these financial institutions are engaging in FinTech is to improve their performance, for example. So to enhance uh, their cash flow position, uh, to enhance financial position as well, they may use uh, FinTech technologies. They also use FinTech to respond to competitive pressures. As we just said before, that there are new entrants into the finance field. So financial institutions are also using FinTech to respond to this competition. Also, FinTech is used by financial institutions to capture new investment opportunities or in order to grow. So one of the ways for financial institutions to grow is through the use of FinTech. The third model uh, for uh, FinTech is the one which is offered by large technological firms, such as Microsoft, uh, such as Huawei, such as Apple, uh, also uh, other uh, technological firms. So for these technological firms, they use, uh, I mean, uh, their platforms uh, to offer financial services as a way to enhance or to improve the quality of their platforms. So their platforms is used for other means, but is also used to offer financial services. The fourth model is the one offered by the infrastructure providers. So they use the FinTech, I mean, as a means to sell to financial institutions to help them digitalize or to improve the risk management or to improve the customer experience. So these are the four main models of uh, FinTech uh, in snapshot. Next slide, please. So now turning our uh, attention to the relationship between uh, FinTech and financial uh, inclusion. 
uh, in the existing traditional banking model, uh, a number of individuals and a number of uh, uh, institutions for some reason or another do not have the access to the financial system or to the banking system. So financial technology and innovations actually provide access to these individuals and to these institutions through mobile technologies, for example, or through digital products or through uh, deploying agent networks and data analytics. So by using these technologies, we allow those individuals and those businesses to access the financial system. Also through financial technology and through financial innovations, we can offer tailored financial products to low income, particularly in developing economies. So mobile applications, for example, are used to offer micro insurance or to offer microfinance, micro savings and remittance instruments. Uh, and also financial technology helps to reach people who are in rural or remote areas. I mean, those, for example, who may not have access to bank branches or financial institutions. So they can use their mobile applications and other technologies to access financial products and to access financial solutions. So as you can see here, I mean, financial uh, inclusion is offering a number of benefits to those who cannot access uh, the financial uh, system. Uh, the next slide, please. Also, uh, financial uh, technology, it helps those with a low credit score to improve their credit score. Because one of the reasons why those individuals are not accessing the financial system is because they have a low credit score. So by having fintech solutions, we can help those individuals and those businesses to improve their credit score. And in doing so, this will help them to access the financial system. Also, financial technologies enable individuals to meet financial obligations, how they can do this by consolidating their debt. So, for example, fintech firms or financial institutions through financial technology solutions, they can offer consolidated loans. So what is a consolidated loan? Is bringing all the debts into one pot. And by, I mean, by putting all the debts into one pot, it helps the individual to manage their debt or to manage their financial obligation in a much more efficient way. Also financial technologies, it helps to provide customized advice to those who are over indebted to give them or to allow them to be more financially stable. So as you can see here, there are immense benefits for FinTech in terms of financial inclusion. And next slide, please. But like uh, any other solutions that we offer in our lives, uh, FinTech is not free from risks. So there are a number of risks which are associated with the use of financial technology and innovations. Uh, the main risk we face in FinTech is the lack of cybersecurity, meaning those who are using FinTech may be exposed to cybersecurity, including hacking, for example. Another risk uh, in using FinTech is over lending because the FinTech providers, for example, may give what is perceived as cheap loans or cheap financial uh, services, and therefore individuals may take more of those products. And later they may find that they cannot repay the amount they received in the first place. The other risk of uh, FinTech is the overpricing. Some of the rates applied on the FinTech solutions may be higher than the traditional financial instruments. Meaning you may find that the rate on the FinTech loan is higher than the rate applied by the bank or financial institution. And the overpricing can lead ultimately to the first element, which we said before about not being able to repay eventually. The other risk of fintech is the element of fraud, because we have what we call electronic financial crimes. So we have the normal financial crime, and we have what we also call electronic financial crime, and fintech may result in an increase in electronic financial crime. Another risk is the blacklisting. When the data by an individual or by business is given to a fintech user or fintech provider, 
it can be shared amongst the fintech providers. And this might result ultimately in the black listing. So what we want to say here that fintech, it has it, uh, its own benefits to individuals and to businesses, but be aware that it has also risks. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the future of fintech and financial inclusion? We expect that financial technology to continue because, I mean, we expect that innovations in financial solutions will uh, boost, I mean, uh, the, the products that we offer in the financial system. And we expect that the financial technologies will increase further financial inclusion. But there are four elements that we need to pay attention into despite of the expectation of the increase in fintech towards financial inclusion. The first element is to make sure that we enhance technological skills. Because to prevent, I mean, the risks that we just mentioned earlier, we need to make sure that individuals and businesses, they have the know-how and the skills necessary to use those products effectively and in the right way. We also uh, recommend that there should be an increase in digital literacy, in including, for example, how to use uh, mobile applications, how to use, I mean, those uh, fintech products and the rest. The other element is to provide suitable regulations. At the moment, fintech providers, particularly the startups and the new providers are considered to be less regulated. So banks and other financial institutions are more regulated than the fintech startups. And because of this, these startups may be subject to more risk or more exposure to risk. Therefore, there is a need for more regulations, particularly for the newcomers and the new startups. Also, there is a need to improve consumer protection. By the use of these new solutions, I mean the fintech solutions, there is other elements that consumers, they need to pay attention into, including what we said before about the element of fraud, the element of cybersecurity, for example, and the element of blacklisting. Therefore, the regulators and authorities, they need to have in place policies and rules that ensure a better protection for consumers. And the other element is the improvement in the payment system. So the use of these technologies and these innovations do improve the way we make our payments and the way we invest and the way we lend. But of course, also subject to the risks that we mentioned earlier. So all in all, we can say that FinTech is a good phenomenon, is also helping to enhance financial inclusion but it's not free from risks. Next slide, please. So just uh, uh, to thank you so much for uh, uh, listening to my presentation. And if you want to read more about this interesting topic, my advice to you, uh, one of the papers I published myself last year in 2020 by the Italian uh, Banking Association Bank Carrier and is entitled FinTech Innovations, a review of the recent developments and prospects. And also we welcome your questions in the chat box and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Hafid. I think um, a very interesting introduction and an important issue around uh, financial inclusion. Um, just a reminder to, we've got a couple of people who've got their hands up. If you could actually put your questions into the Q&A box, um, we'll be able to put those to the panelists at the end of the session. So do keep your questions coming um, so that we they will shape the Q&A discussion at the end. And then now we will turn to our third speaker for today, which is, who is David, and he is going to talk um, still on the topic of finance, but he is going to talk about a very popular new area referred to as decentralized finance. He is also the course leader for the MSc in investment risk and finance, and he was previously an investment banker. So over to you, David. Oh, thank you very much, Karen. Hi, guys. Welcome. Thank you so much for taking time to attend. I hope you're enjoying it so far. And my colleagues have saved the best for last. <laughs> so I'll give you a brief presentation on, on uh, DeFi. And can we hit the slides, please? 
So in terms of myself, I thought I'd introduce myself first. I'm a, a fintech pioneer. I started programming for Dow Jones back in 1987. And Dow Jones is a huge uh, uh, financial uh, organization, lots of fingers and lots of different pies. I started building bond pricing software for them, went to Deutsche Bank, and of course, Deutsche, a tier one financial institution. I started out on the government securities desk and I actually worked in a bunch of different areas. I just don't put them on the slides too much. The, the big hop for me or big leap, I should say, was when I moved into risk management. Risk management, of course, is concerned with ensuring the financial institution can, can weather risks, financial shocks, and they're not, not rendered insolvent. They don't further disrupt the financial institution. So very new area back then, this was 1992, um, growing very, very rapidly, still growing today. And after my time at Deutsche Bank, went to ABN AMRO, a Dutch bank, very similar to Deutsche, except it focuses on Netherlands. And we also had exposure into South America, as well as uh, uh, North America also. And then I finally went to an organization called Moody's, a ratings agency. So I saw the business from a little bit different perspective that way. I'm very active in, in lots of financial and lots of technical areas, specifically cryptocurrencies and DeFi. I buy Bitcoin every week. I've been buying Bitcoin every week for a long time. I bought Bitcoin last Friday. I'll buy it this Friday. I just buy Bitcoin. That's what I do. And I'm currently very interested in decentralized finance. I tend to spend a lot of time programming, building models, and just exploring technology. And we'll talk today about DeFi, and I'll give you guys some details about what it does and things like that. Can we go to the next slide, please? So we're gonna be talking about DeFi, decentralized finance. I'll hopefully get you guys interested in this very emergent discipline. It very much is the next frontier. So we'll see when we start to get deeper into it, we're building upon a lot of the work that's been done and you're no doubt familiar with it with cryptocurrencies and blockchain, but we're taking all this to the next level. We're coming up with a system a mode of finance that is what we call trustless. And I'll speak more about that later. Uh, we are also disintermediating. And really what that means is one of those big words, right? Really what that means is that we're removing intermediaries from transactions, an incredibly wide range of intermediaries. And they all have one thing in common. Intermediaries are expensive. So by adopting DeFi, we can start to really reduce prices and we, We'll talk further about all this, and we're going to talk a little bit about the future, but we, we are expecting, and it's already started, the existing intermediaries, they're not going to go quietly into the dark. They're, they're going to be with us for a while. Uh, next slide, please. So let's start out by introducing the topic, and then we'll get deeper and deeper into it. So DeFi, as you probably caught on right now, is decentralized finance. And what we're doing is we're practicing finance. We've got a form of finance that is emergent, but it's based upon blockchain. Next slide, please. When we base our transactions, our, our practice of finance on blockchain, much like we don't need intermediaries for transactions where I can send Bitcoin to somebody, I don't need or we don't need financial intermediaries. Who are these intermediaries? Well, brokerages, exchanges, banks. The list is very, very long. And once again, the intermediaries, and that's the whole science of banking, intermediation. When we eliminate the intermediaries, when we can move to this trustless finance, we see that costs fall. And it's very much a democratic exercise, I believe. Uh, next slide, please. So DeFi is exciting because we can offer an incredibly wide range of financial instruments. We can offer anything centralized finance or what we call CFI can do. Anything they can do, we can do better. And it's all based upon blockchain. Now, once again, guys, this is not the blockchain that some of you, I have no doubt, have bought cryptocurrencies and that's cool. But typically you're dealing with blockchain 1.0. This is made possible by something we call blockchain 2.0. Next slide, please. Let's try to understand exactly what DeFi is by doing some comparisons. So when we compare DeFi to CeFi, we say that DeFi is trustless. CeFi requires trust. Banking is a relationship business. 
guys, I you know worked at Deutsche and ABN Amro for many, many years. And you have to get out there and press the flesh. You have to be a people person to be successful in banking. You get out there, you shake the hands, you look in the eyes, you do a deal, you sit down, you have some dinner, some lunch, whatever, and you hop on a jet and you're in the next country. That's CFI, centralized finance. DeFi, we don't require trust with our counterparties as they're called any longer. And you'll understand exactly how this is possible when we get a little bit deeper into it. Next slide, please. Other differences, DeFi is open, CFI is exclusive. And what I mean there is centralized finance banking is very much a club. If you want to work in CFI and centralized finance, of course, Westminster will really help you get an excellent qualification that will put you, put you into the banks and things like that. But let's face it, at the end of the day, to participate in any meaningful way in CFI, centralized finance, you need certain memberships in organizations and clubs and credentials and things like that. DeFi is open. Decentralized finance is democratic to the point where anyone can become a market maker. Anyone can become a broker dealer. All you need is access to the appropriate protocols, a little bit of capital, and you're on your way. Next slide, please. Other differences when we compare DeFi to CeFi. DeFi is fast and cheap. CeFi is slow and expensive. I'll refer back to something my colleague Hafid mentioned. I, I have assets in the States. Periodically, I bring money over. And in the old days, I used to use wire services. Wire, it's the only way you could transfer money. And when we transferred money, you're talking, sometimes the money when you did a wire transfer would disappear for days and nobody knew where it was. Now I use a service called WISE. It's, it's TransferWise and it's been rebranded. It's instantaneous. DeFi is fast and inexpensive. CFI is slow and expensive. Next slide, please. So now I've got you interested in this. How does it all work? Well, it works by using something called a smart contract. It's a smart contract that is executed. It's resident on a blockchain and it's executed on a blockchain. And by using a computer program, lots of problems disappear. Next slide, please. A smart contract is nothing more than computer code. It's a computer program, much like you might run on your PC, your Mac, your tablet, your phone, but it's got one difference. Smart contracts are executed on what we call distributed systems, which means not just one tablet, one phone, one Mac, but hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of different computer computers, all communicating with each other, all executing the same code, all making sure that nobody's trying to pull a fast one. Remember, this is trustless finance. We don't need to get intermediaries and in, intermediaries in there to trust. We've got computers that all execute the same program, and they all have to agree. Next slide, please. It's really important to understand what's, what the value that they add. When we build a smart contract, we program what, are called, what, what, what we call in finance the parametric definition of the instrument. Basically, this means all the terms of that financial product are written into a computer program. Both sides of the transaction are locked in. It's just like a legally binding contract, except it's no longer a paper contract. It's a contract that's written on a computer or run on a computer. Next slide, please. So we see that there's no need for intermediaries. We don't need people anymore. The distributed system, hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of computers execute the smart contract. The smart contract eliminates the needs for intermediaries, obviously, but think about other costs, guys. Enforcement cost, insurance against fraud, all the regulators that come along for the ride that are part of the system called centralized finance that's been evolving for centuries. We're going to do away with it. Here's an example. I own and operate a fairly large property business. I've been building up this property business for over 20 years. I've got assets in three countries, Australia, the US and the UK. When I buy a new flat or a new house, it can take three to five months for solicitors to review contracts. The cost can be maybe 5,000 pounds. What if we replace the paper contracts with smart contracts? Why do we need solicitors at that point? We don't. Why would it take months to complete a property transaction? It won't. DeFi is already disrupting the property business and many, many others. Now, you're more familiar with smart contracts than you think. And this is a perfect example of a smart contract. Smart contract, a, a vending machine. 
We engage with a vending machine to get biscuits or coffee, or if the time of day is proper, beer. <laughs> we don't have to worry about counterparties. We put our money in, we get our product. The issue is vending machines are electromechanical and they're subject to failure. But think about this. We all know a properly written computer program is very, very reliable. Next slide, please. So DeFi allows us for trustless transactions. We no longer need intermediaries. Both parties are confident that a transaction will be executed and upheld. The contract, not the intermediaries, not the regulators, not the lawyers, they compel counterparty performance. Next slide, please. And finally, why DeFi? Well, think about this, guys. We can support, as I mentioned, all existing financial products that CFI can, but many new ones. Here's my, my favorite example. I'm operating in this space now. DeFi allows us to borrow or lend funds. I operate in a niche called flash loans. Anyone want a loan for five seconds? How about 10 minutes? The demand is there. I do business in this area now. Centralized finance can't do it. Centralized finance, they like to lock you in for long periods of time. A 30-year mortgage, a seven-year car loan. They won't even do uh, pay, uh, paycheck lending. But the, so there's demand for these types of loans. This allows us to do pretty much anything centralized finance can do, even to the point where I have a lot of Bitcoin and I lock it into liquidity pools. And instead of the Bitcoin just sitting in my wallet, earning me nothing, some of these contracts will yield 30, 60% a year. It's absolutely incredible. And we can do this all without financial intermediaries or regulators. Next slide. And this is the leading edge, guys. It's emerged over the last two years. It's growing explosively. Last year, we saw 20 billion in staked liquidity. Now we're roughly up to about 100 billion or so. And we expect by 2022, there's every expectation we may crack $1 trillion. Just as a point of contrast, uh, Bitcoin itself has a market cap of about 1.4. So DeFi has come out of nowhere. It's really exciting stuff. We can do everything that CFI can do, but we can do it in a trustless way and much, much cheaper. Just a word of, of caution. It's still very much a, a chaotic and very exciting area <laughs> to operate in. I think it's going to take about three to five years if it follows the Bitcoin trajectory to stabilize to the point where people, without the benefit of education like Westminster can offer you to actually operate in that space. Uh, that's it for me, guys. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope you're interested in DeFi. Thank you so much, David. Um, very interesting. There's lots of comments in the chat of how interesting it was to be introduced to this uh, new emerging area. So um, we're now on to the Q&A session. So I'll invite my colleagues to join us by switching on their video cameras. Um, so we've got quite a collection of questions in the chat. So I'm going to do my very best to respond to as many as possible and link them up a little bit. Um, so I think one of the themes which um, it might be useful to just touch on first of all is um, something that's repeated a number of times and that's around jobs and internships, so links to companies. So we've talked thematically about the role of digitalization so far, but I wonder if we can now kind of link up what we've been talking about to the courses we teach and then kind of explain the types of internships um, and job opportunities there are. So could I start perhaps, I don't know, with Sergio? Yes, hello again. Uh, so I teach on the MSc in digital business and over the past um, three, four years, because this is the fourth year that it is running, we have been collaborating with a multinational company called Chubb Insurance. And the way that we have collaborated with, with uh, Chubb has been by uh, developing software for Chubb. So student projects uh, where the requirements of the software were given by the company and the students worked in group groups. And uh, by using uh, initially in the first years uh, on the so-called no-code platform, uh, they were able to uh, develop um, apps, uh, both phone and also desktop apps, in relation to what Chubb uh, required. Uh, this year, uh, Chubb collaborated with us on the dissertation module, and um, the group of students who worked on, on this actually uh, used uh, machine learning via the Microsoft Azure platform, 
and developed a, an application uh, which was able to um, evaluate risk, so insurance risk, in a different manner by analyzing the unstructured data, such as uh, tweets. So um, this, this tweets related to a specific company if uh, an event happens and so on. Um, so uh, this is how we have collaborated with a specific company. And in terms of, so there, there were no internships, but actually student projects. And in terms of job prospects, I can say that uh, one of our students um, uh, is actually now working with Chubb as an information security analyst. Uh, so it's a permanent position. She started as, um, I think, on, on actually on an internship or a one-year contract. And previous to her, another student was working with Chubb as well. He's not working there anymore because uh, he moved on with his career. Uh, so this opportunity actually gave our students, um, uh, some of our students, uh, actual jobs. Thank you so much, Sergio. I think that's very interesting for people to hear a kind of particularly a particular example. Um, and maybe David, if I could bring you in at this point, because you teach on an MSc program, I know that you've got a number of people joining us today who might be coming to your program. And I think as a postgraduate course leader, perhaps you have some examples you could share around internships and job prospects after studying some of the finance postgraduate programs. Uh, hi, thank you, Karen. Uh, yes, I'm actually I'm, I'm MSC IRF Investment and Risk Finance course leader, but I'm also employability director for the School of Finance and Accounting. So if I could step back just a little, I could speak with you briefly about the resources we offer. And there's a huge array of resources we offer. We concentrate throughout your studies on giving you exposure to different tools, techniques, and workshops that will improve your ability to interview well. Uh, for an example, well, just to give an example of what we're doing, unlike many other institutions, by the way, uh, we focus on, or we have offerings in what's called digital assessments now. And a digital assessment is how firms hire these days. Uh, the old days when I was at Deutsch hiring people, we'd put an ad in the paper and HR would give us a bunch of CVs and we'd invite 12 people and we knew we were gonna hire one at the end of the day. Those are gone guys. And Westminster's forward thinking the institution recognizes that. And my report on that side, Dr. Catalan Ilyes, uh, put together a team that allows us to offer digital assessment training to students, where you learn about the various automated tests that you'll be facing before you have to do it for real, before you actually have to do it on the day when you interview. We have the standard CV workshops and interview workshops as well, things along those lines. But we've also got internships that we offer virtually. And this is through an organization called Farage. Really incredible opportunity. I always invite students or I advise students, you should do about half a dozen of these Farage internships. You're working for an organization, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. I mean, just name them, they're there. You're working for the organization. You're doing an internship for that organization, just as if you were on site, but it's carefully structured. So it takes between four to about 10 hours. Now, the value of this is you can actually conduct an internship, get a feeling for it. And you think, ah, I don't really like that type of work. I don't really like that organization. Let's try something else. If you like it, you can put it on your CV. They give you a license for LinkedIn, for LinkedIn, LinkedIn so you can put a certificate on your profile. And more importantly, you get an entree with that organization. And there have been students that have been offered full-on internships and actually ultimately hired on that basis. We've got other resources that we bring to bear. There's about a dozen different programs, but the, the point is that Westminster is thinking ahead. So we're preparing you during your entire time here, as opposed to other institutions that you might look at where you go through this grueling master's program or undergrad program. And then at the end of it, it's like, my God, that's it. How do I get a job? And uh, no, we don't do that. We pair it together. So I hope that helps, Karen. It does, definitely. Thank you. Um, I mean, and maybe I can then turn to Hafid on um, another question that we've had that's quite interesting, looking at the concept of fintech, but maybe a dimension of it that you didn't have a chance to bring out in your talk, which is how the different role for central banks compared to financial private financial institutions, um, and I guess some of the costs and benefits to these different types of institutions. 
Uh, many thanks, uh, Karen. That's a very interesting uh, question. But I just would like to also maybe comment uh, on the first question. I would like to say at the Westminster Business School, we really uh, look after our students and we uh, give them, I mean, uh, enough uh, resources, learning resources, and also we have a number of employability events taken at the school. And in my past experience as course director, uh, I mean, I had a number of students who completed uh, a degree at the Westminster Business School and did manage to find uh, very good uh, jobs in investment banking and retail banking. And they also managed to progress well in their uh, career. So there are a, a number of uh, very good stories around uh, student success. I mean, at the University of Westminster and in particular Westminster Business School. Now coming to your question about the role of the central bank. As we said, uh, for the fintech providers, we have uh, different uh, providers. We have the traditional financial institutions and we have the fintech startups and we have the technology uh, companies. So uh, banks or central banks are mainly uh, regulating uh, incumbent financial uh, institutions such as uh, banks which they need to comply in terms of capital requirement, in terms of risk, in terms of safety, and the rest. But the uh, startups and the fintech specific companies are not subject to the same uh, regulations, actually, which allows them in a way to uh, uh, take more risk and also maybe to expand uh, further. So the way where I see the central bank can play more role is towards the existing financial institutions, because they need to comply with the central bank regulations. But for these uh, startups, uh, the regulators, they need to think of uh, other ways and other means so they can also uh, be uh, regulated. Because at the moment, uh, financial institutions are at a disadvantage compared to these startups because of the regulation uh, uh, element. The regulators, including, for example, the Bank of England is looking actually to this because of the issues we mentioned earlier that there are risks attached also to the FinTech and financial uh, technologies and the regulators, they need to ensure that the risk is minimized and is also to make sure that the consumers, I mean, individuals and even businesses have to be uh, protected. So all in all, I would say the answer is of two folds. Uh, the first one is the uh, financial institutions, which are well covered by the central bank. But for the startups, the, there is a need for uh, further regulations to make sure that there is a safety net in terms of the products they offer. Mm, mm, thank you. I mean, I wonder whether I can talk to David now and probe him further on a theme that you started there, which is around risk, um, because I mean, I think David presented generally quite a positive picture of decentralized finance. Um, and I guess we've had a few questions in the chat about um, the current risks um, around the process of digitization, which we've seen, or such as, you know, the crisis we had in Facebook, now called something else, of course, um, and uh, the worry over cyber attacks, which, in fact, in universities, even we've seen uh, certain universities have experienced cyber attacks. I just wondered whether we could pick this up with you about, you know, the risk side of the process of digitalization in the context of, you know, your description of decentralized finance. Oh, that's a really good one, Karen. Thank you. There's there's really two dimensions to think about it. We could talk about putting on my, my Deutsche Bank or risk management hat. We could talk about traditional financial risk. And the central banks under, under Basel tend to do a very good job of managing financial risk. In other words, we do hear talk every now and then about a bubble in cryptocurrencies that could threaten the world, blah, blah, blah. That really is this, the intermediaries from centralized finance talking. They're trying to shut down this very vibrant sector. So as long as we operate typically under the realm or under the auspices of Basel and pay attention to market credit operational risk, there really isn't too much of an issue financially from that point of view. On the other side though, I know Hafid talked about cybersecurity. This is an emergent area. This is very, very big. And the more liquidity, the more money, the more businesses are done online, the more crime is going to surge. Now, unfortunately, we can only harden our systems down too much. 
or pardon me, to some extent, we can't go the full way. This will not really correct until we see a technological adoption of a technological standard called IPv6. That means Internet Protocol version 6. We're currently running IPv4, Internet version, Internet Protocol version 4. And what the difference is, is that under IPv6, absolutely every device that is ever on the Internet will have a unique address. Now they don't. And because of that, there's room for a lot of fraud. So when we get when we migrate to IV, IPv6, Internet Protocol version 6, because every device will have a unique Internet Protocol address, if there's a machine or an actor that's engaging in fraud, they can be identified, targeted, and shut down very quickly. So we do have to wait for technology to, to adopt. Uh, if you own a Macintosh, if you own a, a, an iPhone, I'm not super sure about Androids. The support's already there for IPv6. It's curious because we were going to adopt it. We were in the early stages right before the global financial crisis, way back in 2006. I was attending conferences talking about IPv6. And then because of the vast sums of money that were expended there, we didn't do much with it. So there will be hope at some point. And that will tie in. And if you join us at Westminster, if you study my computer or computer technology or banking technology course, we talk about the internet of money. We talk about the internet of things. Right now, everything on the internet, all the traffic's glommed together. Once we migrate to IPv6, once we start to see the internet of money emerge and the internet of money diverge from the existing internet, I think things will be a lot safer. It just takes time though. Thanks very much, David. I think that's a very interesting bit of detail on security issues. Um, if I turn to Sergio, there was an, uh, what I thought was a very interesting question in the chat um, around how realistic is the use of digital twins for smaller firms with financial constraints, maybe small startups? Um, you know, how realistic is it that they could actually make use of all these kind of technologies you describe and the data management techniques? Yes, that, that, that is a good point because we all know about the liabilities of smallness of, of small businesses and uh, the resources are lacking. I, th I think the, 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 the answer is, is about um, not implementing all at once. So you wouldn't have a digital twin that a company like Mott McDonald would, would have. So a large multinational company. So it really depends on the requirements for which the digital twin is being uh, realized. So it could be a, as, as simple, as I said earlier, to uh, monitor the, let's say the, the, the temperature and the, the humidity of, of part of the building. And that's probably relatively uh, straightforward. Um, but then when we get into uh, other objectives such as, um, well, maybe not the national digital twin, but uh, wanting to have a digital twin of a, of a city, for example, and there are digital twin models of, of cities out there. Uh, yes, it could, it could be, the cost could be uh, quite expensive. Now, having said this, however, if you look at the uh, providers of digital twin technologies, many of them are actually uh, startups. So I know the question was about the use of digital twins. Uh, but in terms of, of providers, I think the most original providers are actually small, small businesses for, I think, obvious reasons because of the flexibility here. And one of the examples I mentioned in the slides was uh, uh, Build Dots. Um, and also um, there, there is uh, an Italian company and it's, one of the pictures is, is from them there in the slides um, called Almasoft. So uh, there they, they have created uh, what's called a building information uh, modeling software for 3D models, uh, which is uh, it has won awards and is, is quite effective. So uh, the, the, the person who, who asked the question is quite right. If you are a small company, a small business operating in the construction industry, uh, yes, there are these, these constraints. And, and I mentioned the fact that in the whole supply chain of, of construction, you have a multitude of companies, both small and large, which are working with one another, and they need to exchange information. Now, hopefully the vision that's set out by the National Digital Twin, where they're working on this common uh, foundational data model, 
may 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 help us in the sense that uh, this would come for free, and therefore uh, even small businesses could adopt this this type of uh, data model to integrate with big, let's say, large and small uh, companies in the sector. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um... And then, um, as we're kind of coming close to the end of time, I would like to just bring Richard in, if possible, um, on two points that I picked up from the chat of what are reoccurring themes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, one is, I think, um, around offers being received, because I think a number of people listening today have kind of submitted their applications and are waiting for offers. And I think it would be useful just to maybe re-emphasize who you could contact, maybe your contact details or, you know, such like. Um, mm -hmm. And then second of all, I think there was a number of people who were keen to link up with other people who might be on their course or planning to be on their course in January or even maybe next September or linking up with people who are coming from the same country perhaps traveling so I don't know whether you could give them any ideas about how they could do that. Oh thank you Karen um, yes so uh, it's great to see so many students with us today who've made an application to join us either in January or in uh, next September um, I know I've been replying to a few questions about kind of looking for offers so it is um, obviously it's, it's quite a large university to get many applications. So it can take a number of days, even a few weeks sometimes for, a, for a, a team to make an offer to you. But if you do feel like you've been waiting a little bit of time and haven't had a, a response, then really do get in touch with us at the university because I can, I can kind of follow up just to check that everything's in hand and there's no delay. Um, and also to make sure that our admission team aren't waiting on anything from you just to, to make sure that everything's in hand. Um, the best way to get in touch with our admissions team would be just to simply reply to the, the email offer you've or email kind of correspondence you've had because that goes directly to your admissions officer. But failing that, I'm happy for you to get in touch with me and I can then kind of make a few inquiries for you. I've posted my, um, my email address in the chat, but I'll also, um, I'll also kind of give it at the end of the, the presentation so you can take down my email address if you really would like to follow up um, on your application, because we want to make sure that it's as smooth and easy as possible for you to, to join us. Um, in terms of getting in touch with people before you arrive or getting in touch with students on the programme at the moment, it really is fantastic. You're you know, so keen to kind of to connect. I've seen lots of uh, lots of talk in the chat about setting up groups to, to connect with other people who are here today. And we do have some groups for, for students and prospective students, which you might be able to join. They tend to be hosted on Facebook at the moment. So I know, uh, for example, our Indian office have got a fantastic kind of Facebook page where you can join and get involved and talk to people before you arrive. And also find out details of our pre-departure briefings we hold in many countries. So often there'll be a, a briefing in your home country or perhaps online at the moment where you'll talk to our team, but also meet other students who are going to be joining us in January or, or in the September intake. And that's a good way to ask any kind of questions about kind of even the little things about life in the UK, what kind of things you need to bring with you. Um, and it's really good just to make friends as well with other people who are going to be studying with you before you arrive to, to mean that you can kind of really get into to life in London straight away. Um, so do check out our Facebook pages of that. If you just search on Facebook for University of Westminster and then your home country, you're likely to find a, a page which is related to, um, uh, to, your, to your group. And the other thing to keep a, an eye out for is if you are joining us in January or in September, do keep an eye out for invitations to our welcome programmes. We tend to open up about a week early for our international students to arrive um, and do a, a welcome week where there's not only the opportunity to kind of get a lot of the administration done, so talk to you about registering with the police and opening a bank account and all those kind of formal things you have to do when you arrive, but also do some fun things like meet other students who are studying with you, have some tours of the city, do some social activities, and that is to really help you feel settled into life at the university um, before the, the classes start, so that when they do start the classes, um, you can concentrate fully on your studies and you already feel at home in, the, uh, in Westminster. Um, I hope that has helped, but like I say, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of leave details of my email address at the end of the session. So then you can contact me if you have any follow-up questions specifically related to your offer or your application. 
Thank you so much, Richard. Um, so I'm going to give Richard a few minutes at the end, which will be particularly useful if you're joining us um, and you're thinking of coming to Westminster. You've made your application, but you've not yet joined us. Um, but it just leaves me to say before handing over to Richard, thank you so much to the panellists who put a lot of time and energy into joining us today. And also all the people behind the scenes who uh, make this happen. Um, and of course, to all the audience who've joined us today. It really has been a very lively um, audience. Thank you so much for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get through all the questions, but I hope we answered a fair selection of them. Um, so stay safe and well, and over to you, Richard. Thank you, Karen. Um, so yeah, just to leave you, I was just going to do a quick recap on how you can find out more information about the university and, and make an application. I know a lot of you have, uh, have already applied. If anyone is thinking of making an application, either to join us in January or in September, then the, the first place to look is always our website at www.westminster.ac.uk. Um, on there, you can check the entry requirements for all of the programmes. We do have a great section on the website as well, which is specifically for international students, where you will find uh, a button called your country, and then you can select uh, where you've studied previously, and it will give the entry requirements in your local uh, curriculum, which was really helpful. If you do have any questions and you're not quite sure whether you're, you meet the entry requirements, uh, do get in touch with us. Um, there's also a live chat function on the website, so you can ask any questions live, while you're online, or all of our email contact details are online as well. So you can send us a, a quick message just to check if you meet the entry requirements. Completing the online application form, it's free of charge. Um, and like I say, you don't need to do it all in one go, so you can kind of duck in and out and and add bits and pieces to the application form as you go along. Uh, we try to make it as straightforward as possible. Um, and just bear in mind, you need to keep have your educational background, so transcripts and certificates. If you don't have them to hand, do complete the application form and you can always supply those later on. Similarly, you can supply your proof of English language ability, so IELTS, for example, at a later date. Uh, we did have a few questions today about English language on the chat. Um, like I said earlier, we do accept a number of different language exams, including things like the Duolingo or password exams, which you can take online. And we've got links to, to those exams and also details of requirements on our web pages as well. Um, after you've made your application, you'll receive your, your offer, either conditional or unconditional, hopefully. Um, and like I said, at this time of year, it can take a little bit of time. If you've applied now for September 2022, there's a, a few people in the chat mentioning that um, the apply for September haven't heard back yet. Uh, that's simply because we have a lot of applications also for January. So we're prioritizing those ones which are joining us in January because I know we've got a little bit less time to, to organize everything. Um, but you should receive a response relatively quickly from our admissions team. And if you don't have a, a response from them, then do follow up because we want to make sure that we have all the information we need and we're not waiting on you for anything. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the fees, they vary for each course, so they can be quite different for some of the courses. So do check on the course pages and you'll see the specific fee for each of the programmes we offer. And the final slide is just a, quickly to highlight some of the programmes which we have here at Westminster, which um, have kind of an element of digitalisation and disruptive technologies. Um, this isn't an exhaustive list. Other programmes will also kind of touch on the themes which we've discussed today, but these are some of the, those programs which I know a lot of you have made applications for or are thinking about applying for. Uh, it include the, the FinTech and Business Analytics program, which I know is very popular. We've had many people join us today who are thinking of making an application for this program already have done so. Uh, also the Investment and Risk Finance program, which is um, David's program, who you heard from today. And also our new program in Digital Marketing Management, which uh, incorporates elements of digitalization and disruptive technologies. Uh, we also have some fantastic programs in entrepreneurship, innovation, and enterprise development, digital business, and an MSc in data science and analytics, which sits outside of our business school, but still has those elements of, uh, of digitalization and disruptive technologies in the program. And finally, our MBA program, which, uh, which is a quite a new program. It's a, it's a free experience MBA, so you don't need to have uh, the five years of experience you need for many MBA programs. It really is a fantastic innovative program. So I really would recommend uh, taking a look at uh, the MBA program online just to see 
uh, what kind of program it is. And also there's a great video on there where you can learn a lot more about the MBA program. I've highlighted on here a number of programs which do have January starts available. So if you were hoping to start a, as soon as possible, then the FinTech program, the Investment and Risk Finance program, Digital Marketing Management, and the MBA are all available to start this January. Uh, but I must add that if you want to join those programs, you really do need to make an application as soon as possible. So there's a final deadline to submit the application for January start programs uh, later this month towards the end of November. So do get your application in as soon as possible. And final thing is just to leave you some contact details. One event I really would recommend is to join a postgraduate online open evening that's happening next week on the 10th of November. Uh, you can sign up online uh, to join the program. Uh, and that's a really good opportunity to talk to some current students, maybe talk to some more members of staff or talk directly to any of the panelists today. Um, and maybe have a virtual tour of the university as well and find out a lot more information about the university. So do sign up and join the online open evening on the 10th of November if you can. And then to contact us at the university, we're on all of the, the usual channels, so Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, you can contact us on those platforms. Um, and also here we have our course inquiry, which is our general email address, uh, which you can contact the university at. And as I said, I will give you my, my email address. If you do want to get in touch with me to follow up on an offer, uh, the email address is my initial r.bolsher, which is my surname, which is written on the screen there. So r.bolsher at westminster.ac.uk. Okay, uh, so thank you for joining us today. And we hope to, to see you all soon here in London at the University of Westminster. And um, wish you a, a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you.